within the context of my Mercury project that is published in the in this paper that was a collaboration between three different departments department of movement science mechanical engineering and the De department of development and regeneration at k Leuven, and also department of applied physics in the university of eastern finland to give an overview of what i'm going to present today i'll start with an introduction an overview of the methods overview of the results and finally the conclusions and the ongoing studies with the method that we developed in this paper so i start from cartilage degeneration and osteoarthritis cartilage is a soft tissue that covers the end of the bones in within the joints and it's responsible to reduce the shocks within the joints during movement and also reduce the friction during the movement. A perturbation from healthy state of the cartilage can happen due to injurious loading, presence of a defect in cartilage or biochemical degradation that cause cartilage to degenerate and the osteoarthritis to be formed. And this will cause a lot of pain in, human, in the patient joint and also limits our joint movements. A degenerated cartilage is usually accompanied with an altered microstructure of the tissue and to prevent osteoarthritis and target therapies, it's important to answer two, two questions. Are the different drivers altering the cartilage microstructure in the same way and what is the interactive effect of degenerative change in different microstructure components? To answer these two questions, it's challenging or even impossible to use in vivo or in vitro studies. And for this purpose, we aim to use in silico modeling to further our understanding of the disease and also be able to answer the questions about the, different, the difference in the change in the microstructure of the cartilage during different osteoarthritis processes. For this purpose, we used finite element modeling. We created a finite element model of a cartilage block that is a cylinder with the dimensions that are shown here. And we, in the finite element model, we used a depth dependent cartilage microstructure. So the, our model accounts for the solid fluid biphasic structure. That means that the total stress within the tissue is combination of the stress due to the existence of the fluid pressure and also due to the inside the solid matrix. And there is a depth dependent solid ratio as observed experimentally also within the cartilage. And we have less solid ratio at the superficial layer. And by going toward the depth of the tissue, we have more solid ratio. Cartilage also contains negatively charged proteoglycans. They are responsible to control the water content within the cartilage with their negative charge, and they will cause a swelling pressure and chemical expansion within the cartilage. And they have also a solid matrix that we use a hyperelastic material model to simulate them. So for the fluid phase, we have a swelling pressure that is a combination of the two terms that are shown here. The negative signs show the nature of these stresses that are compressive. And we have a pressure due to chemical expansion. Delta Pi shows the swelling pressure, the donor osmotic swelling pressure, and mu F shows the chemical expansion within the, the chemical expansion within, within the cartilage due to the existence of the water content. And then there is a hyperelastic Neuhukian material that is used as the solid matrix of the cartilage. And also because the swelling pressure and chemical expansion both are dependent on, on the negative fixed charge within the cartilage, the, the fixed charge density content is also depth dependent. So they will, the, this depth dependency of fixed charge density content will affect the stresses within the uh, donor osmotic swelling and also chemical expansion terms. 
and also cartilage contains collagen fibrils. These are viscoelastic fibrils, and there are different families of fibrils within the cartilage. So we have a summation of the stresses due to presence of different viscoelastic fibrils within the cartilage. And the car collagen content also is depth dependent, as suggested by experiments. The orientation of fibrils are arcade shape within the cartilage, meaning that in the deep layers, the fibrils are perpendicular to the cartilage surface. And when we come towards the superficial layer, they become parallel to the surface. We also take this into account by having the collagen orientation like this. We, here you see that the, 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 the angle with X direction is shown. So we have perpendicular to the surface at the bottom and super, in the superficial layer, we have parallel to the surface with fibrils. So to summarize, we had a finite element model of the, a cartilage explant that with depth dependent contents obtained from histological microscopy within the literature. And the total stress is summation of the stress due to the compressive pressures within the cartilage and also the stress within the solid phase that, that is the hyperelastic material and the viscoelastic fibrils. But the aim of our study was to simulate the degenerative mechanism within the cartilage. And all the, almost the main experimentally observed degenerative mechanisms in cartilage can be categorized as shown here. There are collagen fibrils, reorientation, collagen fibers degradation, and proteoglyc and depletion. That has two effects. Loss of the fixed charge density, the negative charge that are accompanied with the proteoglycans, and also loss of the solid matrix. That means that an increase in the fluid content. And for modeling this process, we proposed a cartilage adaptive reorientation degeneration or in short, CARED model. This model uses the results of the finite element simulation. Under, it's possible to use different loadings, but in this study, we used a an unconfined compression loading to simulate the experimentally observed degenerative mechanism within the cartilage. For that, we took maximum principal strains and directions as output of the finite element model. And to simulate the collagen fibers reorientation, we had fibers reoriented between the maximum principal strain directions. So we had a preferred fibril direction based on the magnitudes of the maximum principal strains. The details are explained completely with the equations within the paper. And then we reoriented the fibrils toward that preferred direction. Then we had collagen fibrils degradation that was based on the strain in the fibril direction. And if this value was passing a threshold of 10% that came also from experimental studies in literature, we had an exponential decrease in collagen fiber content. And to model the protoglycan contemplation, we used the maximum shear strain. And if this value was passing the 30% threshold, we had a decrease in proteoglycan content that was linearly related to decrease in the fixed charge density content and increase in water content. And all these thresholds were selected based on experiments in literature. Finally, the new contents were inserted as for the next iteration of the finite element simulation. And the simulations were repeated until 50 iterations where we saw less than 5% change within the contents of the cartilage under similar loading. So with this algorithm, CARED can simulate the main, main experimentally observed degenerative change within cartilage. For analysis in this paper, we created three sets of finite element models, one a normal uh, cartilage under normal loading as a reference that was a, an intact explant with two megapascal unconfined compression within 0 0.1 second that, to, that is simulating the normal loading 
within the cartilage during the gait. And then we had the injurious loading model that was a four megapascal unconfined compression in 0 0.1 seconds. And then we had focal defect models. That was the model with different def defect depth that are simulating the different ICRS grades of the cartilage with a defect under normal loading. As a result, for the reference model, we didn't have a huge difference with the initial contents after degeneration that shows a minimal degenerative change in contents that was less than 5% of the initial content. And this was according in accordance with our expectations that under normal loading in an intact cartilage, we have minimal degradation. And for injurious loading model, the fibril reorientation was observed in the superficial and middle layer, and the fibrils tended to reorient towards perpendicular to the surface. And if we compare that to the experiments from literature, we can see that in OA, the fibrils are the, the fibrils tend to reorient towards perpendicular to the surface in the superficial and middle layers. For collagen degradation, we saw an intense collagen decrease in collagen content in the superficial and middle layer, mainly in the superficial layer. And this is also in accordance with the experimental observations within the literature that saw an intense collagen breakdown in the superficial layer. And for protoglycan depletion, that was the FCD loss and solid loss, we saw a, an intense decrease in the superficial layer and middle layer. And the, if we compare these with the experimental observations, we can see that there is an intense decrease in the protoglycan content in the superficial and middle layer of an OA cartilage or in, within a cartilage under injurious loading. And as the result of our focal defect model, we compared the model with different defect depth, and we saw the maximum reorientation in ICRS grade two defect that had the, the middle defect depth. And it was interesting because the tip of the defect was in the middle zone of the cartilage where the the fibrils are had a random orientation so they they are not perpendicular to, to the surface nor parallel to the surface in that layer they are changing the orientation so this caused an increased strain around the crack tip and increased their reorientation and if we look at the fibril degradation we can see that the minimum fibril degradation happened in ICRS grade two model with the maximum fibril reorientation. And we could interpret it as a, that uh, with this fact that decrease of deformation in fibril direction after reorientation could protect the collagen fibrils against the degradation. And we saw the maximum fibril degradation in the cartilage with a smallest def def defect depth. And it was because the tip of the crack was located in the superficial layer with minimum fibril density. So the maximum deformation in the model happened in the weakest zone. And then we had the maximum fibril degradation. And if we look at the protoglycan depletion, that was modeled with fixed charge density loss and increase in the tissue hydration, we see that there is an intense protoglycan depletion around the crack in the superficial and middle layers of the ICRS grade three model with the biggest defect depth. And this is because the large deformation around the opening of the crack with the maximum defect depth. So in conclusion, we, we saw in the intact explant as the reference model, minimal degenerative change under normal loading that was 
in accordance with our expectations. And we, in the injurious loading model, the results were in qualitatively in agreement with experimental observations. We observed reorientation of collagen fibrils toward the direction perpendicular to the surface, intense collagen degradation at the surface, and intense portugulicon loss in the superficial and middle zones. And for the focal defect model, we observed intense collagen degradation, reori reorientation, and portugulicon depletion both on the surface and around the lesion, and also cartilage lesion depths is a crucial parameter affecting the tissue degradation. And another interesting result that we, we, we had from our in silico modeling study was that the fibril reorientation might prevent or slow down fibril degradation under condition in which the mechanical homeostasis of the tissue is perturbed, like the presence of the defect. And we are using this model for our ongoing studies to for ac accurate calibration and validation of the model against experimental results we planned by reactor experiments that is ongoing and we will do some histological measurements to quantitatively calibrate and validate the model and we aim to use the model with whole knee joint geometry to compare against animal studies and human MRI measurements. That is in process between our group. And finally, in my micro project, I aim to use this, mod this model for model-based optimization of treatment approach that is in progress for optimizing the in vitro tissue engineering by reactor protocols. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to answer the questions. ESP Online Journal Club and for all the participants who joined today. Uh, I'm very excited uh, and I of course have questions uh, but I would uh, like to open the floor for questions to our audience first and um, if you're comfortable you can turn your camera on and ask your questions uh, and uh, uh, just like an FYI uh, the screen is being recorded so if you have a problem you can just the choose to switch off your camera and that should be fine uh, so we have one question from Michelle Conti uh, so uh, uh, if you would like you can go ahead and ask your question hello everyone thanks for uh, uh, participating to this initiative so <clears throat> I would like to ask how what is your strategy to to create uh, a party specific model if if it's uh, something uh, that you would like to do or it's it's uh, not uh, not relevant for for the activity so you, you get an average uh, population average uh, uh, approach thanks for uh, and congratulations thank you very much so yes this is our purpose to use it for patient specific modeling and we aim to use MRI measurements to characterize our model parameter and then use it for each patient. So with, M with MRI image of each patient, you will have data for, for MRI map from MRI maps about the contents of the cartilage and from the methods like dense imaging for the deformation field within the cartilage that we can characterize the parameters of our model. And then it, this is in progress in our group with a PhD student, Ikram Mood, who is working on that currently. Thanks. Yeah. Mm, wonderful. I always appreciate when modeling is asked to validate their ex uh, model with experiments, but hardly ever happens the other way. <laughs> that was sarcasm, by the way. <laughs> And um, there are a lot of complexities to validate it. Of course. <coughs> yeah. That's why we model them. Uh, uh, Marco, would you like to go ahead? I know you have questions also. Or should I ask? <laughs> You're muted. Just very quickly. Uh, uh, what software did you use for fighting elements? It's Abacus. Okay. 
so, so this is a UMAT basically or the, the material model is based in UMAT but I use MATLAB for the degenerating model so the yeah, yeah. is in, inside MATLAB but Satanic who is here now he's transferring I think the model to the UMAT all the models so the, the, all the process will be inside the UMAT and you didn't need a custom element so it's a UMAT not a UEBL right no no it's it's only UMAT very cool okay I have like a, a very nice idea about Abacus but I want I was really intrigued by the uh, structure itself like you have written uh, that there are many uh, different primary fibrils but I couldn't picture like how they are oriented or where they are placed and uh, like for me it has to be like a structure somewhere in there like how do you say to the model that there is a fibril here if I you mean how I like I implement the fibril orientation yeah, how, in the esterases? Yeah. The effect of how is the so, like how does the model know that this is the fibril and it has to degenerate in this particular line? So there is the fibrils are applied to the model with their effect on the stress. So in with the, this green term in the total stress. Mm -hmm. And this stress in the fibril is based on the direction of the fibril as well. So the fibrils can only stand the tensile stress. They cannot stand for compressive stress. So they we cannot apply a compressive stress to the fibril. And the, so if we have a tensile stress on the on the element and in the direction that the fibril is defined, there will be the maximum stretch inside the fibril. Mm -hmm. So the direction of the fibril is taken into account in creating this stress. And if you need more details about the how we have the equations, I didn't explain that in the paper because it's based on also other previous works. This this work, but there are citations to the works that there there is the detail about the equations how it's related to the fibril direction. Uh, my question was more about like uh, what you said, like the elements where these fibrils are. So yeah. like that, like how do you? put these elements like how does the system recognize that oh this is a different fibril like this is in the superficial layer is uh, like are all the elements considered as fibrils or like there is a particular direction in which the fibrils that is what I'm asking okay so first the fibrils content is defined with a density oh, okay. factor so there is a density factor that shows the fibril content that is multi multiplied to the esterases. Okay. And then th this shows the fib fibril content. Okay. And then how many fibrils we have in the fibril in the in each element? We have seventeen fibrils in each element, mm -hmm. four of which are primary fibrils, and they are oriented as shown here. Th these are the four primary fibrils. So if we are deep inside the cartilage, the element is here. They are all perpendicular to the surface, but if we are in the superficial layer, they are all parallel to the surface. So we multiply this direction also to the stresses. So if then the strains are in the fibril direction, we will see that that there is the maximum stress in the fibril. I I don't know if I answered your question. Uh, no, you did. Uh, is that? maybe why you see the reorientation only in the perpendicular direction because <clears throat> the fibrils are already sort of um, perpendicular to the surface so th this is this orientation is based on experiments mm -hmm. so experimentally we observe in cartilage that they are perpendicular to the surface in deep layer and parallel to the surface in the superficial layer but the reorientation is based on the the, the strain that the fibril the maximum principal strains that are around the fibrils. So if, for example, imagine that you have a fibril oriented with an angle and you are applying a strain in other direction. So the, it's like a rope that yeah. reorients towards the direction of the strain. Okay. 
So this is like this, and it it doesn't matter like which matter direction. that which orientation they have initial. But of course, if the if the principal strains are in direction of the fibrils, so we don't see any reorientation. But if they have an angle with that, they reorient toward it. Okay. Um, anyone else from the audience before I ask? even more questions uh, uh, please feel free to ask uh, anything about the model about the paper um, I don't see any questions Marco any more questions I was I was interested in one of the last things you showed when it comes to experimental let's say verification of the protective role so if you just could you know tell us more about it I, I know it as you said it's extremely challenging and, and and I understand that of course so we planned some bioreactor experiments we we take the cartilage explants from human knee joints so they are from the surgery the left over of the surgery and then we create the explants and in we will have some explants that are intact and some explants with a defect that we will create inside them. And then we put the explants under loading in a bioreactor. So during time, we take out some of the explants and we fix them, we, we stain them, and then we take the se sections for histology. In histology, we can measure the fibrils reorientation, fibrous orientation at different time points of the bioreactor loading and also co collagen content and portoglycan content and also water content. And having these data at different time points of the loading, we can calibrate our model with a set of experiments and then validate it with another set of the experiments. And, and what is the time scale that you you are you have in mind? So it, for the moment we we want to do it one week, but, but we we are not sure if it's enough to see the change within the cartilage. But no, but it's understandable now that possibly the regimes in the in the very first days and in the long term are different. So your model could yes. also maybe not cover both, right? So it's yes. understandable. But this is based on also previous experiments that they in the literature. Okay. We selected this time region. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Oh, and by the way, it means you can you can actually can you keep the cells alive when you take the explants? So when you go into the bioreactor, it's basically the same cells. Yes, we can keep the cells alive in the bioreactor. Very cool. Yes, but then when we take them out, we fix them and then we do the section and the staining. There is no need for for measuring the the viability of the cells because it's not covered also by the model. Um, for the model itself, what will you say are the next steps? Sorry. For the model itself, what will you say mm -hmm. are the next steps? Like, how can you improve like the model? You did show that you will do like a whole. Knee, but that's going to be like a massive jump. What is the intermediate jump? So it, 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 it's actually not the massive jump, jump because I, I won't change the model. Mm -hmm. The generation model will, won't be changed. It's just the, the geometry that will change and we take the mesh from the whole knee joint and then we use the same model. But for the degeneration model itself, I think including the chemical degradation that is started already in our collaboration in our collaborative group in Finland so to see the effect of the chemical degradation because it's not only mechanics that degrade the cartilage there, there are also chemical effects that degrade the cartilage this is also a next step in the modeling and maybe if we want to go further a multi-scale modeling to see the effect of the loading on the cells and then what the cells react this is also the work mm -hmm. that Satanic is focusing on so how the cells react in terms of the gene expression using gene regulatory networks and then come back from the gene expressions to the tissue adaptation can be next step, I think. Uh, because I saw in the picture that you showed in your future work that it had also like 
more than cartilage it was not just cartilage so i was like maybe you have like something for the bone i am so it, this is also in progress in another work with by a postdoctoral researcher for the bone in the rat model in our group judith is working on that to she has she did some experiments with rats then she wants to use this model for the cartilage degradation and then another model from another collaboration for the bone degradation and combine them to compare with the results of the rat experiments that she has okay um Uh, are there any questions from the guests? Um, it doesn't uh, seem like so. Um, uh, okay. So uh, maybe uh, one final question then. When can one contact you? Like what projects should one have in mind to come in contact with you? Or like can they apply if? they are a master student or bachelor student to work with you of course we it, that would be our pleasure to receive like, contact what, and master students like what should be their background like what they should already be doing to contact you for that so what i myself <laughs> focusing on is with the in silico modeling using the finite element simulations and also this adaptive algorithms and also the, the characterization so to, to do some experiments on, to characterize the cartilage. So I think someone with background in mechanical engineering, I appreciate this background for, for the benefits of this background for our works. And also with the biomedical engineering backgrounds, more focusing on biomechanics. Okay. So but finite, with, 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 Final modeling is the major <laughs> part that we are focusing on at the moment. Perfect. Um, does anyone have any more questions? Um, if not, then I would like to uh, conclude. Marco, can I conclude? Of okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, uh, thank you and uh, thank you everyone for joining the first ever ESB Online Journal Club. And uh, you were a wonderful speaker also, Eli. I hope we meet again sometime. And uh, I hope we can meet others also again. So this is a journal club where you can submit a manuscript as a first author. And then you get to uh, broadcast it to a wider audience. This uh, will be put on YouTube and on our official channels. So you will have... Uh, your article exposed to a lot of people who would then be interested in collaborations or citations. So uh, nevertheless, it's a very good opportunity. And I hope uh, you can avail this opportunity the next time we have this journal club. And with that, thank you, uh, Ali. And thank, thank you, you, Marco, Anna. for moderating with me. And yeah, I hope you have a nice rest of the week. Thank you very much.